lead us to reign, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Shining, 
and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. The word of the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 99, which we will read in unison. The Lord is King, let the people tremble. He is throne upon the cherubim, let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion, he is high above all peoples. Let him confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One, the mighty King, lover of justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God, and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. Moses and Aaron amongst his priests, and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them out of a pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. O Lord our God, we answer them to thee. You are God who forgave them, that they punished them for their evil deeds. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God, and worship him upon this holy hill. For the Lord our God. Thank you. 
Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. words of my mouth, and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our healing. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Part of this sermon is actually a continuation of Karen's sermon from last week. Our readings that day included five very short, very different similes about what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. And I love that she spoke of it as though we we're turning a prism to get a little bit different look at what the kingdom of what the kingdom was like and what Jesus meant. But I'll be straight with you. After those readings, and then her sermon, I was confused and dissatisfied with what actually gets printed in our Bibles. Because how literally are we supposed to take something that is clearly not supposed to be taken literally? How far do we go? The two that really frustrated me and have caused me to wander and wonder a lot this week are the parable about the mustard seed and the parable about the leaven. The mustard seed was planted in a field and the leaven was mixed into some bread. And when we read it literally, even though it says the kingdom of heaven is light, when we read it literally, Jesus reminds us that the mustard seed is the smallest of seeds, even though it's not, and becomes a large tree and hopes to all kinds of animals in the field. So without any further interpretation, it's clear that you're supposed to know that the analogy is that the kingdom of heaven will grow from the very smallest thing into the very largest thing and grow and flourish. You know you're allowed to go that far. And same with the leaven. You take a tiny piece of leaven, about a scoop of it, and you mix it into a huge container of bread dough, and it will spread all through the bread dough, increasing in volume of bread, giving it flavor. And without further interpretation, you can go that far. It sounds again like Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of heaven will start with just one person, and is able to touch all of creation inexorably. You just have to let it get started. And if you left it there, that's good stuff. I'd sign up for all that. God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our food. By his hands we all are fed. It's good. Very nourishing. Nothing startling in there. Nothing even remotely something worth dying over. And isn't that what everybody wanted to hear? God is a gentle, loving God. God loves us. God wants us to be loved by him and each other, all good. 
But then, Jesus asks a question. Do you remember? Do you understand what you just heard? And he said, yes. But we should be worried about that question. Because if it was just as simple as the way he made it sound, there's no doubt we would understand it. God's kingdom grows. But he did ask the question, do you understand it? And then we find out that maybe there's something deeper, something behind all of this that we didn't quite get on that first reading. But even though it's a simile, a metaphor, an analogy, you know, of course, we're supposed to not take it literally. But maybe we didn't really understand what he meant, especially here in the 21st century when we get all of our food from Kroger. Maybe we didn't understand. So I hope you were as frustrated as I was when Karen last week reminded us that there is a different layer. There is a deeper interpretation that we wouldn't have easily come up with if we just read it even as literally as we did. Because what was, it's, and it wasn't a huge difference in the message, but it was different. You didn't have access to the scholarship that we now have to further explain the context. So, what was the real message? What did Karen reveal to us last week? The real message wasn't just that God's kingdom will grow, but that God is wild, and that his kingdom will grow according to his will and not ours, and that you will not be the same at the end of that is how you start. You will be transformed. Tell me. Because even though it wasn't stated, even clearly we learned from scholarship since then about that time that if you planted a mustard seed in your field, it would take over. It would destroy that field. Whatever that field used to be, once you had planted a mustard seed in it, it would no longer be that field because the birds would come and the animals would come and you would no longer have this nice, pristine field. And what does that mean? That means the very people that you disapprove of, that you look down on, that you ignore, they will actually be there in the kingdom of God, right next to you. It will not be what you wanted it to be. Same thing with the leaven. Even though if it wasn't stated, we learned that leaven, just imagine a jar you have of your sourdough starter, you mix that in with your bread dough. Once you do that, it's done. You can't undo it. Once the leaven gets into that dough, it will move. The water and the flour in your dough, which you're keeping nice and tidy and pure, will now begin to ferment and have CO2 building up into it. And it will reproduce quickly and spread all the way through it. And you can't even see it happening. It's just going to happen whether you want it to or not. So if your intent was to keep the flour pure and unleavened, i.e. stick up, stay with people just like you, adding just a little leaven will ruin your bread dough. For the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of heaven, we do, we have flavor, we have diversity, we have every room for everyone and everybody, no matter what. And the understanding isn't that we will stay the same. The understanding is, no matter what, we must change as that kingdom comes. But you wouldn't have gotten that from the reading. The reading just said it's going to grow. It wasn't going to be painful. It wasn't going to be transformative. It wasn't going to be disappointing and shocking. But we know that that deeper lesson is the real lesson. And maybe we would have figured it out because of the other things that the Bible does say. But for sure, we now know that that understanding is because we have now looked deeper and now tried to understand what it meant to be a mustard seed in a field and what it meant to have leaven in your bread dough. And we looked at it a little more critically and said, you know, it's not sunshine and cookies. It's going to be a transformation of pain. And that frustrates me. I want to understand what the Bible says. But now I have to go outside the Bible to, un to truly understand what it meant. Because even though I stated as an act of faith when I became a deacon that the Bible contains all things for salvation, it's clear that I am too far away. I am 2,000 years away in culture and time 
to easily understand and get the same message that the people who heard it the first time got. So it's almost as if every Bible now should have footnotes, lots of footnotes. This is what it says, and a footnote. This is what it meant at the time, and a footnote to that. This is what you now should understand. Because you don't. Because if we know, if we know that the people who heard Jesus and wrote down what he said didn't write down what they understood because of what he said, I'm not going to get the same understanding. So even though we call the Bible that we use for the Episcopal Church the newly revised standard edition version, newly revised standard version, I think we need a new, newly revised standard version to keep up with all the things we're learning. Because why would we risk someone else reading what we read and not understanding what we now understand because we've gone a little deeper, we've gone a little outside and done some more scholarship? Why do we risk others not getting the same message even though we now know what it was that Jesus was actually trying to say, say to us. And this was why Jesus put that question in there. Do you understand? And every time he does that, we should te be tempted to say, no, I don't think I do. Try again. Because remember, the person who wrote a letter today to us was the poster child of trying again and not understanding. So this is from Peter. Peter was one of those people who had heard Jesus, talked with Jesus about what he heard, got it wrong, tried again, talked to him some more, got it wrong, tried again. Peter is us. But we also heard today that Peter, we also need to remember that Peter saw. Peter was there. So Peter was on the mountain. And even as confusing as that was, Later on in his life, even though he didn't know it at the time, what it would mean, and maybe only later realized what it meant. It was a thing he held on to. Remember what he says about this. He said it was a lamp shining in a dark place. It was a light before the dawn. And that's because he was there. It happened to him. So you can imagine his frustration in the letter that he's writing, because in his own lifetime, the way has already become misunderstood, mistaught, misinterpreted, and distorted. And he is surrounded by people who are trying their best to figure out how to convey to each other what's happened, and what our changed relationship is with God. And maybe they had good intentions, but he came up with a phrase that got my attention very quickly. He says, we did not use cleverly devised myths. And that should give us all cause for thought. Because myths are things we, we make up and attempt to understand something real. So like Zeus being the cause of thunder and lightning by throwing lightning bolts. Or like sacrificing a dove so that you can return to your community. Or like Apollo's chariot being the thing that holds the sun as it goes across the sky. Like eating fish on Friday. Like not eating chocolate during Lent. Or a prosperity gospel. All of these things are things we make up to fill in the gap to what we know. I mean, maybe you could even say you know, that the whole book of common prayer could be a cleverly devised myth to come, to come up with reasons for why we do the things we do. And I'm going to pick up just one the Nicene Creed, which we will be reading together in a few minutes. And it has a little bit of a myth in it right now, as it's printed. There's a short phrase where we talk about the belief in the Holy Spirit that says, we believe that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Well, you know what? We actually don't believe that. Perhaps, therefore, we might never have been supposed to believe never true. In the 6th century, it was added. And for those of you who studied church history, 
This was the great schism. This is where we split from the Orthodox Church. Those three words proceed from the Father and the Son. And the Son meant that the people who adopted it, that the Holy Spirit was not the same as the Father and the Son. And it caused a great schism, wars, deaths, persecutions, permanent splits. For 1,500 years, those three words have kept us apart. And that should make you angry, because three words shouldn't keep us apart. Fortunately, 30 years ago, we decided as the Anglican community that we were wrong then, and that we would agree to take that three word, those three words out of our Nicene Creed. And you can say, is this a big deal? Is this worth talking about, those three words? It comes and goes. Does it make a difference? Well, it makes a difference to some. How many of you remember Stephen Richards? He, he was a faithful Christian here for a long time. He and I served together up on the altar. He was an acolyte with me. And he was a very careful, thoughtful, particular man. And I admired him very, very much. I admired his integrity. And when he and I would say out loud the Nicene Creed together up here, he would omit he would not say it because he knew it was important to not say it anymore. And whatever he could get away with it, he would not say it. Because to him it mattered. It mattered to him to say what you believe and believe what you say. And amen on that. This has come up a lot. At the youth group weekend, um, this is, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I was still working with the diocese youth groups. We made a large copy of the Nicene Creed. And we put every, asked everybody to come up and put a green check mark against each of the lines in the creed that they could easily believe and follow. And a red X against the ones they didn't think they could easily believe or follow. And let me tell you, it was not all green. We obviously all don't believe the same way. We can't all say the same things with certainty. And that's okay. That's why we're here, to figure it out. Because some of these things are small things. There really are very small differences between what we say and what we believe. And the Episcopal Church has been through some big things that we should be very proud of, that we look at all the time and change. Homosexuality, women being ordained, all meaning all. We've been through a lot of change, and we look at it all the time, and we should be very proud of that. And it's worth sharing what we've learned about those struggles with other people. But about what should we do about the things that we don't agree on? Is it possible that, all, that some of the doubt and the hypocrisy we feel about the things we say are also things that can ferment and spread? until none of us really believe what we say or say what we believe. I don't know. I struggle with that. But I do know that this is the right place for us to be. I know that this is the right kind of church for us to be in, for those of us who think about this and worry about this and want this to be open discussion and how things change. This is the right place to be. So I'm going to resolve today to say out loud what I know I believe, and if I don't know, fine. I might fake it till I make it. I might just go along until I figure it out. But we will figure it out together. So personally, at a minimum, I believe that I need to be in a community of people, of wandering, curious, flawed, hopeful people. I believe that I don't have all the answers and that I'm supposed to ask for help. I believe that I must love my God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I know that I must love my neighbor as myself. And I know that I must act accordingly so that others may see what I understand to be true. And I'll see you out there.
page 8 in your service leaflet, I invite you to stand as you are able, and together let us affirm the faith of the church in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God for God, Light for light, true God from true God, the God not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and into the state of For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in the course of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and Son. But with the Father and Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together. In your love and reveal your glory in the world. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Mark, our bishop, Karen, our rector, and Dick, our deacon. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for Provence de l'Église and Vacan du Congo. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the bishop's visitation to Christ Mary and for the people of Christ Mary and for their rector, the Reverend Emily Edmondson. We pray for grace and peace in the Diocese of Haiti. And we pray for our companion diocese, the Diocese of Leeds, and their bishop, the Right Reverend Nick Baines. In our parish cycle of prayer, we pray for our coffee hour and hospitality ministries. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. We pray especially for an end to gun violence. God, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others, and to your honor, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially Jessica, Ron, Mary, Andrew, Shelby, Lawrence, Tanya, George and Rita, Val, Shauna, Loretta, Sandra and Fred, Courtney, Lucian, Judy, Carolyn, Hugh, Louis, Lori, Neil, Gabe, Woody, Fred, Mary, Collins, Joseph, and those we now name either out loud or in our own hearts. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died 
especially those we now name out loud or in our hearts. That your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may fly in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. I invite you to be seated unless you have a July or August birthday or wedding anniversary. I was on vacation the first Sunday of July, so we're catching up. Wow, you're a lot. We have a lot of eight
receive that and go back to your seat. If you want to receive wine, you have two options. One is to drink from the common cup when it comes around, that's the larger silver chalice. And then the other option is to dip your wafer into the blue pottery chalice when it comes around. Um, so all of those options are there for you and we hope you will all move forward. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us and offered a sacrifice to God. <laughs>
you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
Jesus Christ, for he will never lost in life. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he will never lost in life. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he will never lost in life.
eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, to love and serve God. Thanks be to God.